Is Crusader Kings 3 too easy? The easy answer is yes. The harder answer is that it has different priorities. There comes a time in any game's development period where the designers have to ask themselves something. Where is this game going? It sounds like a simple question, but its answer is no simple matter. The direction of a game is, in fact, the fulcrum, whose position will determine the leanings of the game's mechanics. The Crusader Kings franchise, and especially Crusader Kings 3, has been looking for that perfect place on its own game design seesaw, with Crusader Kings 2 sometimes leaning in less than optimal directions. The binary game design pieces on each end of this precarious plank for Crusader Kings 3 are its game mechanics and its story mechanics. A common binary in many games, but one which takes on a special form in this particular instance. The often labyrinthian systems of Paradox Grand Strategy games find themselves welcome amongst the player base's hardcore gamers. But Crusader Kings 3 is a curiously received entry into the library for many. I ascribe that to its shift towards the opposite end of most Grand Strategy games on the game design seesaw. Crusader Kings 3 has taken a step back from its complex Grand Strategy roots, finding its own niche within the genre. This shift so far has created what may be one of the greatest PvE strategy games to exist. The upcoming Royal Court DLC, insofar as it has been marketed, demonstrates this impeccable philosophy through its focus on how the quantifiable game mechanics work to create the intricate stories that bring players back to the game time and time again. Today I'm going to talk about the design philosophy of Crusader Kings 3, the challenges the game faces in incentivizing the style of play that it was intended to have, and the place Royal Court plays in furthering the connection between developer intention and player expectations. Any game that places so much power into the player's hands is taking a huge risk on whether or not players will want to tango. The game essentially asks them to create something out of not just a sandbox, but a beach of pure sand. Many players of all sorts of games play how they want to play, not how the designer wants them to. Xander Kings 3 has dared to give most of the power to the player, only providing a series of rules, some ways to manipulate them, and infinite possibilities along with a dash of utter callousness in the face of hardship. Consider one of the dreaded systems in Crusader Kings 3. Partition Succession. While a veteran player will come to manipulate this rule quickly, many new players will certainly feel a sense of confusion and distaste for what they perceive to be a convoluted system. In many ways, this gameplay loop for Crusader Kings 3 is shaped by this confusion, with the player finding myriad ways to break free from the partition rules. This might be sending the kids off to the monastery, shipping them of their birthright, or a tyrannical show of force. Regardless of how they do it, the gameplay loop in all cases is the circumvention of the rules themselves. Even in warfare, a strong opponent may be defeated with a certain selection of men at arms as a direct method, or perhaps a particularly savvy terrain choice. Other ways may include a well-placed dagger in the right back, and for some, a convenient marriage and a particularly red wedding may be the answer. Again, we see this same gameplay loop for a series of rules by which the game plays, and the player doing everything in their power to remove them from the table. This, in essence, is the design philosophy of Crusader Kings as a franchise, an arcane rule set acting as a barrier to entry for what is ultimately a completely open, sandy beach of possibilities. The joy of Crusader Kings 3 is, for an inexperienced player, wiping their brow knowing that their realm will not be divided amongst their five warring sons. But what about the game after the mastery of this loop? Once the mechanics have been cracked wide open, what are the next steps for the player? In most games, the player's skill is measured by their ability to defeat the challenges presented to them by the developers. The traditional difficulty selection screen, if afforded the luxury of choice, will present to the player one of a few challenges that the developer has in mind for them, and players may feel satisfied in passing that bar. How about for a game that presents no bar? Assuming the player has mastered at least a few ways to circumvent the rules, which may take a few hundred hours of experience, they have no more bars to face. Any veteran player knows that simply obtaining power for your family and dominating the map politically is a simple task without any restrictions. Since having mastered the game, there are no rules to abide by anymore. Once you have your genius, herculean, beautiful, fecund, and inbred family of monsters and enough building upgrades to have an income to support some powerful men-at-arms, the game is defeated. This is where the new bar is nonchalantly placed in front of the player, this time by the player. How can they manipulate the quantifiable elements of the game to create the most interesting game at a qualitative level possible? If you go on Reddit, the posts about making 10,000 gold or about obtaining legendary dynasty renown are essentially gone, replaced, by interesting stories and pictures of beautiful maps. Oh, and uh, also the occasional noob with two upvotes looking for help about either Partition Succession or Crusades who refuses to use the print screen button and just snorts about 10 pounds of cocaine before busting out their Nokia phone camera for a snapshot while riding by on a skateboard mid-kick flip. Yeah, those are the best. Most people recognize that the developer intention for this game is to generate stories and to provide a robust system that facilitates that. 
Seder Kings as a franchise has never been about complex warfare or accurate economics and systems in that sense, but rather about the chaos of the medieval dynastic world and interpersonal politics. The franchise, and especially Xero Kings 3, has focused in on those interactions over other ones. Paradox has set up systems that, upon mastery, incentivize player-driven challenges and story creation, leaving it almost entirely in their hands. The idea that players can meta their way out of fun things is horrifically true in Crusader Kings 3 by a much larger margin than Crusader Kings 2. A player who ruthlessly crushes all opposition and plays perfectly will see through the, honestly, rather exploitable mechanics in the game. I'm looking at you, renowned system. Cooperation between the player intention and developer intention is important to the fun of Crusader Kings 3. This is not to say that the player should artificially lock themselves out of mechanics. A player incentivized to not interact with a mechanic is ultimately a failure to make that mechanic interesting or fair. Consider the Nemesis system from Middle-earth, whose full breadth is only experienced if the player obtains a fail state. That mechanic is so good that players will intentionally fail to have that experience. The problem with this is why should a player ever play by the rules of the developer? Skater Kings 3 does suffer from this issue, because its symptoms do not incentivize their own use in a meaningful way. Middle-earth does not suffer from this problem. This is because the Nemesis system incentivizes its own usage in meaningful ways. Why should I, as the player, construct a fun and interesting story when the game does not incentivize this? Why not just conquer everything, put down all resistance, and control the continent if the game mechanics do not provide quantifiable reasons to do so? Relying on the players to make their own fun is a recipe for disaster in most games. I believe Paradox's team knows this, and that's why they're making Royal Court in such a way that its mechanics incentivize players to use them Similarly to how Middle-earth incentivizes their systems, the unification of developer intention and player incentive. When we examine the major components of Royal Court, both its paid and free features, we see that they play heavily into the developer intention for the game in a way that contrasts itself from Xero Kings 2. The most touted feature for Royal Court is, of course, the court itself. From what we know as of this video being uploaded, the court contains mostly flavor events, artifacts, and a money sink in the form of amenities. None of these things are ways to grab power, they are ways to create a mythos. In particular, artifacts being more fleshed out as personal items passed down the generations that need upkeep and care to remain relevant is an amazing system that will hopefully be implemented well. Let's compare a DLC like Sons of Abraham to Royal Court. Sons of Abraham adds decisions and events for the Abrahamic religions in Crusader Kings 2, as well as modifying other things, but there's an interesting crutch that it leans on. All the mechanical changes are geared around the consolidation of power quantitatively, what I mean by that is that the implementation of pilgrimages, the College of Cardinals, the Ash'ari and the Mutazilite schools, and the usage of monasteries, among others, are mechanics that are built around providing new ways for the player to obtain mechanical advantages. In Crusader Kings 2, monasteries were great for easing succession. The College of Cardinals lets you control the papacy. Pilgrimages were easy piety and high quality traits, and the Muslim schools were either free tech or free piety. In this sense, Sons of Abraham was held back by the dissonance of a focus on mechanical complexity despite the game's intention as a flavorful, player-driven story game. This is why Sons of Abraham only has 75% positive reviews on Steam, while Holy Fury has 93% positive reviews. Holy Fury implemented systems that are much less based around the obtaining of mechanical advantages, the pagan reformations, bloodlines, and coronations. The player could only lightly meta these systems. But the fun was in creating your cosmopolitan, female-only, blood-sacrificing religion with you as the head of it, and hunting for unique bloodlines, none of which broke the game's mechanics. They only contributed to its story. Holy Fury provided a tangible incentive to create an interesting story, by creating DLC that played into the developer intention. The DLC used its base game components to create something that players loved. Going back to Royal Court, I see a Holy Fury design mindset rather than Sons of Abraham. The artifacts that each player chooses to put on display provide some quantitative advantage, as they should, but the choices on what artifacts to refurbish and maintain, as opposed to other ones, will have much more of an attachment to the player since they are personalized, rather than the 20th Jesus special skin pouch that gives 0.5 health. One of the free features that looks particularly exciting is the new culture system. This system will also be heavily unique and personalized to each player, allowing them to express themselves through the pillars they choose, and even something as simple as the name they give it. I hope that like the religion system in the game, the pillars will not be ways to circumvent challenge but rather unique additions to build upon the story. The ability to accept and create cultures in the game will be similar to the artifacts where they act as ways to pile onto your dynasty's impact on the world. At least that's the hope. We'll have to see how these systems pan out, but those are my predictions.
Overall, when it comes to Royal Court, I think Paradox is taking a step in the right direction by using their DLCs as ways to give the player a further sense of development to their dynasty and the impact their dynasty has on the world around them. I'm most excited for the artifact system and the revamped culture system. So, is Crusader Kings 3 too easy? Well, I would say that it's no simple yes or no, but the game was not created to be mechanically difficult. It was created to tell stories. It certainly does a great job of creating those stories, and I would say that its exploitable systems get in the way of those stories sometimes due to how easy they are to manipulate, and the fact that they do not contribute to the qualitative systems effectively at times. That being said, with the design philosophy put on display by Royal Court, I have full confidence that Paradox will continue to innovate on their ability to give us the systems we need so that we can create the beautiful, insane stories that our community strives for. If you enjoyed the video, consider subscribing and liking, and certainly leave a comment about your opinions what I've said here. I love to engage in discussions here on YouTube, on Twitch, and on my Discord, which you can find in the description down below. I've been doing some viewer requested challenge runs on Twitch while waiting for Royal Court to come out. You should join the party too and drop in a challenge. You can also check out my CK3 Achievements speedrun guide if you want more YouTube content. Have a wonderful day.